Oh, uh, we're not on. I am too. It's right here. See, look. See the green light? It's just something twitched here and there. There's a young couple that comes on Sunday nights and they sit over here. Yes. You probably don't know them because she's quite a bit younger well, than you she's are. She's older than I am. She's quite a bit younger she's than you are. Her, older than her sister has been doing mission work in Peru. Her daughter has been doing oh. mission work in Peru. Oh, I thought that's it was my niece. The one that comes here is your niece? No. That's my that's my much older sister. That I think that's your much younger sister. She's my much older sister. Okay. Who who right now is visiting my mother and might actually be watching. So I want to oh, stress yes. how much older. <laughs> well, I'm going to I'm going to stress how much younger she is. Okay. And she wants to do something next month called Coffee in the Country. Coffee in the Country. Yes. So, if anybody wants to know anything about it, you want to be be sure and buy a program Sunday morning. Knows what programs we have? Oh, we have a pro oh the oh one of those. Okay. Well, there used to be bulletins. Now they're programs. Now that they're quarter. But you're getting into marketing now that we're calling this the Jason and Gary show. That's it. So anyway, the problem is, what are the guys going to do? And I had a list and I left it in my office. It was oh, really Gary. a cool list. What are we, what are the guys going to do? Like, like breakfast at the bungalow? Oh yeah, breakfast for boys or Saus sausage in the savanna? Yeah. Gravy for guys. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> now you're talking. Bacon uh, for boys. Bacon for boys. Uh, oatmeal, uh, cap for oatmeal for ogres. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Hey. <laughs> oh, like vittles for villains. Vittles for villains. Yeah, I think vittles for. Oh, villains. hey. Yep. My sister's watching. Oh, so <laughs> <laughs> let's. Uh, did, did I stress how much older she is? She just had her fifty-fifth birthday. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't She's quite that. No, I don't think it is, but you'll never see a banana pie again. Oh, uh, I'm on a diet anyway. Oh, I'll eat, I'll eat your banana pie. Okay. Tonight we're going to be talking about Revelation. Revelation. If we divide it up into seven sections, as we have discussed, this is section six. We are getting dangerously close to the end. And what are we, we going to do next? I was going to ask that same question. I'll beat you to it. I know it. See, that's the tough thing. We don't know what we're going to do next. But anyway, we'll worry about this. We've talked about it. We did, but we didn't decide a single thing. Section 6 is going to be chapter 17 through first two-thirds of chapter 20. And it begins in chapter 17 with a vision of judgment and an explanation. It's kind of an overview of what you're going to be talking about in chapter 18. Chapter 17 is sort of a preview with an explanation. It is. And then there's going to be judgment against Babylon, against the two beasts, and against the dragon. And notice that they exit in reverse order. From the order they came in. Right. They came yeah. in, dragon, two beasts, and, and, and Babylon, the, the harlot, and now they're going to go out in opposite directions. In chapter 17, the first two verses begin pronouncing judgment on that that great harlot. And one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, I shall show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed acts of immorality, and those who dwell on the earth were made drunk with the wine of her immorality. She's called the great harlot who sits on many waters, and later in this chapter we'll find out what many waters are. Mm -hmm. But it'll only confirm what we already know is that they represent peoples, yep. nations, peoples. And we're not just guessing because later in the chapter it says that that's what these waters are. The kings of the earth commit acts of immorality and they're drunk with wine of her immorality. How often in the Bible does God compare spiritual unfaithfulness with immorality? Uh, it's a common theme. It's a very common theme. And... Uh, so these are people who are, are looking to other things other than God. And uh, he says they're guilty of committing acts of immorality. In fact, they're drunk with the wine of her immorality. In verses 3 through 6, we see that uh, the scarlet beast that she's seated on. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast full of mm -hmm. blasphemous names, having seven heads, and ten horns. There again, this is kind of a common theme. Mm -hmm. And the woman was clothed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a gold cup full of abominations and of the unclean things of her immorality. And on her forehead a name was written, a mystery, Babylon the Great, 
mother of harlots, and of the abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered greatly. Now before, it had uh, the mystery. You know, Babylon the Great is a, is a mystery. Mm -hmm. And now if he's the one that wonders. John is the one who wonders greatly. She's in the, the wilderness, and here's another one of those juxtapositions. Earlier, you saw a woman who was taken into the wilderness, mm -hmm. and that was God's people right. that was taken into the wilderness, where she was protected, and now we have the other side of that. Here we, we have this great harlot who's taken into the wilderness, but she's not taken into the wilderness for, protected, for being protected by God. Right. It's just the opposite, but she's, she's covered with these blasphemous names, that, and uh, the seven heads and the ten horns we've talked about, and we'll see a little bit more in detail in just a little bit, but uh, the seven heads, that uh, the, the authority and the horns, the power, ten. We don't have to worry how ten horns fit on seven heads with seven crowns and how they all fit because that's not the point. Mm -hmm. It's the symbolism of the seven heads and ten horns. She's clothed in purple and scarlet. And who usually dressed in purple and scarlet? Royalty. It's usually the royalty that dresses in purple and scarlet. She has assumed that position, and of course, when we see who she is, then, then that, it's obvious that, that she has assumed the position of authority and power. And she's adorned with gold and precious jewels and pearls. And it reminds me just a little bit of when we were in Proverbs and we saw wisdom and we saw the, the foolish woman mm -hmm. that she's makes herself look all attractive right and and the uh, the poor unsuspecting people don't know that it's just a trap and it's just a, a front it, it's dishonest it is it, it yeah it's it's um it's a disguise yeah it uh it's a sickening disguise mm -hmm. that she presents herself so beautifully when she's holding a gold, a gold cup full of the abominations and unclean things mm -hmm. And so you have this beautiful golden cup, but look what's inside it. All of the, the terrible things. And there's a name on her forehead. And we've seen this before, too. The, the people have to have the name of the beast, the 666 on them. But then there are those who have the name of God. And they're the ones who, who get the, the benefit. And the ones who have the, the name of the beast on their forehead think that they have to have that to... to uh, mm -hmm benefit but in fact it's it's to their detriment she's called babylon who is uh, just a code name the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth and she is drunk with the blood of saints the witnesses of jesus and he wondered greatly and so naturally the the angel asks why do you wonder what mm -hmm. you know, why are you concerned about this in verses seven and eight the angel says to him, Why do you wonder? I shall tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to come up out of the abyss and to go to destruction. And those who dwell on the earth will wonder, whose name was not written, has not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they see the beast, that he was and is not and will come. Uh, will come. And notice that he has been wondering, but the angel reveals it to him. But when these things happen, they're going to look and they're going to wonder what's happening. And so this beast carries her and he has these seven heads and the ten horns. He's a beast that was and is not, is about to come up from the abyss. And we'll see that a little bit more too. But the, the beast is the, is the persecution of the Christians. And at the time this was written, they were in a, in a lull where the, the Roman government was not actively persecuting them. Mm -hmm. And so the beast was, he is not right now, but he is going to come back and renew his, uh, his oppression of the Christians. But the fate, his fate is to go to destruction. And those who dwell on the earth will wonder what's happening. They're the ones whose names are not written in the book of life since the foundation. So here's a book again. Some people have the name written in the book of life. Jesus opened a book. And this is the, the book where some names are not found. This is the book of life, and their names are not in it. 
and then when they see the beast, they, they wander. Now the beast has seven heads, and it says, here is the wisdom, the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. And there are seven kings, five have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come. When he comes, he must remain a little while. We're getting a little bit closer to an explanation here because the seven heads are seven mountains. Rome is set on seven hills. In fact, its nickname has to do with the seven hills. Mm -hmm. And so anybody back then would have immediately seen seven mountains or seven hills as Rome. The seven heads are seven mountains on which she sits. And there are seven kings, five have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come, and when he comes, he must remain a little while. And we're going to look at that in just a little bit closer in just a minute. And so you have the, the seven mountains, Rome, and there are seven kings, five are in the past. There's one right now, and there's another one that hasn't come yet, and he will remain for a little while. The first five emperors were Augustus, Tiberius, Gaius, Caligula, Claudius, and Nero. Those were the first five, and the persecution really started with Nero. And so after Nero, five have fallen, and that's the beast which was. That's the, the persecution. The next three didn't have time to do anything except conduct a civil war. Galba, Otto, Vitalius did nothing but fight and kill each other. And so Vespasian is the one who is the time when the book of Revelation is written. His son Titus is going to take over for him from just a short while. But then his other son, Domitian, is going to take over, and Domitian is going to renew the, uh, the persecution with a vengeance. Mm -hmm. And so the, the beast that was and is not is persecution. It was with Nero. It hasn't been, but it will be when Domitian comes back. And so um, the, the beast that was and is not is the eighth. We're going to see that in just a second, what the, the eighth is. Just verse 11 says, And the beast which was and is not is himself also an eighth, and is one of the seven, and he goes to destruction. And uh, Chuck wants to explain this for us, this, this riddle. We were talking about it before tonight, and uh, he wanted to explain it to us. <laughs> I think he's going to take a hard pass. Okay, he passed. The, uh, the seventh is also the eighth because eight is the number of, of resurrection, of renewal. The, the code number for Jesus was 888 mm -hmm. because the, the, uh, the day after the seventh, the start of the new week is the eighth day. Okay. And that's the start of the new, the new week, the new life or whatever. And so eight was the number for Jesus. It's also uh, a number for the rebirth of the persecution. And so he's the seventh, but he is also the, the eighth in the sense that he, the persecution which was and is not is going to renew with him. Okay. And so uh, Domitian would be the one that would really actively renew the, uh, the persecution. As we said before, Nero persecuted Christians because he was just wacky. But uh, Domitian did it because he was just evil. And he was serious with, uh, with the persecution. Then we had the ten horns in verses 12 through 14. And the ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but they receive authority as kings with the beast for one hour. These have one purpose, and they give their power and authority to the beast. These will wage war against the lamb, and the lamb will overcome them, because he is lord of lords and king of kings. And those who are with him are the called, and chosen, and faithful. We have ten horns that are ten kings and they receive authority from, be from the beast for one hour. Rome had a whole lot of little puppet kingdoms scattered all over the place. In fact, Rome wasn't defeated from outside so much as they just crumbled from within. Instead of having their own people be soldiers, they started hiring mercenaries and the mercenaries really didn't care anything about Rome. As long as they got paid, they were fine. If they didn't get paid, they didn't care about fighting, and Rome just started entrusting everything to mercenaries and to all these little puppet kings everywhere, and they would end up being the destruction of Rome. Now their, their purpose was to give power and authority to, to the beast, and they waged war against the Lamb, but 
fitting with the, the message of the, of the book, the Lamb will overcome. The reason the Lamb will overcome is because he's the Lord of Lords and King of Kings, and those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. Just another one of those calls to choose up sides. We can choose sides with the beast, with the seven heads and the ten horns, who's destined to lose, or we can choose sides with the Lamb, because the Lamb will overcome, and that would make us the chosen and the faithful. And so it's just a call to, to make a decision, to make a commitment. This, this all fits in so well as well with the, the vision of Nebuchadnezzar in, in uh, the book of Daniel with the, the kingdoms that were represented by the statue and the, and the stone that was cut without hands falls from the sky and, and smashes everything and it's Rome is that final kingdom that it smashes and it's broken up into, into pieces and there's that one kingdom that remains that is an, an eternal kingdom, a kingdom ordained by God. Right, you have the feet with the iron mixed with clay. And the ten toes. And the ten toes. Yeah. And then the, the clay degrades the iron. You don't have a pure metal anymore. It's just a, it de yeah, degraded. From within. Yeah. yeah, and so it's going to crumble. And it is interesting. You have this magnificent statue, gold and silver and bronze and iron, and this little stone cut out of the mountain without hands will bring all of them down during the time of the ten toes. Right. Interesting. Then verse 15 uh, describes the waters. And as I said, we don't have to guess what the waters represent. And he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. Uh, waters generally represent nations mm -hmm. uh, in prophecy. And this just fits right in with all prophetic languages. That's right. what the waters represent. And in case we can't figure out somewhere else what it represents, we just go here because it says yeah. what they represent. They represent the peoples and the multitudes and the nations and the tongues. And John often does that through the book of Revelation when he's talking about the nations. He, there's often that four, those four names. And it's not always the yeah. exact same four. Sometimes he uses kingdoms and, and tongues and tribes and, yeah. and everything. But there's almost always that designation of those four Four is an important number. Is that that terrestrial completeness, and and so it's all the people of the earth. It's it, yeah. He could have affects everyone. He could have left it all peoples. Yeah, or all nations. But you're right. He he spreads it over four things: peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. That includes everything of everything. Mm -hmm. It's all there, just in case there's something might be left out. Then verses 16 through 18 describe the fate of that harlot. What's going to happen to her? And the ten horns which you saw, and the beast, these will hate the harlot, will make her desolate and naked, and will eat her flesh, and will burn her up with fire. For God has put it in their hearts to execute his purpose by having a common purpose, and by giving their kingdom to the beast, until the words of God should be fulfilled. And the woman whom you saw is the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. Ultimately, those ten horns that she's given power to will end up hating her, and it will make her desolate and naked and eat her flesh and burn her up with fire. That's, that doesn't get much worse than this. Yeah. Uh, that's pretty total. But notice that this is all being done to execute God's purpose until right. the words of God are fulfilled. Yeah. And I think that's, that may be a key line in the whole book, mm -hmm. that what's happening is to uh, execute God's purpose until his words are fulfilled. In Matthew 24, 14, Jesus says, In this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world for a witness to all the nations, and in the end shall come. And there, in that chapter, he's talking primarily about the end of Jerusalem, the end of the Jewish system, that uh, the gospel will be preached in all the nations. And in fact, as we go into the book of Acts, we find that's exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. It begins right there, oops, on the day of Pentecost, in Acts chapter 1. Uh, he makes the same promise in Acts chapter 1. Uh, it's not for you to know the times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. So Jesus promises to the apostles that that's what's going to happen. And it didn't take very long for that to start happening because on the day of Pentecost, there were Jews from Jerusalem and from every, in Jerusalem, Jews from every nation under heaven. Mm -hmm. And so on the day of Pentecost, there were people from all over the world who had an opportunity to hear the gospel message. Some of them went back home and took that with them. 
And so, well, the, the progression of events in the book of Acts, I mean, there's that declaration at the beginning, and then the rest of the stories in the book of Acts follow that exact progression. Jerusalem, exactly. Judea, Samaria, yeah. to the and that, that, That's an outline, and really, from, for the book of Acts. From Rome, it, it ends with Paul preaching the gospel in Rome, and from Rome, you've reached the entire world. Right. You've, you've, made, you've reached the center of the universe, mm -hmm. as far as they were concerned. And there, there are a lot more verses that I didn't put in here, but, but there are progressions through the book of Acts where you see this very thing spelled out. In Romans chapter 10, 17 and 18, it says, So faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. But I say, Surely they have, they have never heard, have they? Indeed they have. Their voice has gone out into all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. The ten horns hate the harlot, and make her destitute, naked, eat her flesh, burn up with fire. But they don't know they're executing God's purpose until his words are fulfilled. Uh, she's the great city that reigns over the king, kings of the earth, that is is wrong. But it's interesting to think about them executing God's purpose until the words of God are fulfilled. We've talked before about when uh, you know, Satan incited the Jews to, to kill Jesus, that Satan must have been really rejoicing because he had won. Mm -hmm. I won. I finally won. I, had, I, I got them to kill Jesus. He didn't know that, that was exactly God's plan. That's what God had in mind all along. You know that it says that at the right time Christ died, mm -hmm. that everything was done according to God's timetable. And throughout the book of John, you see that, that Jesus says, my time has not come, my time has not come, my time has not come, my time has come. Right. The fullness of time was the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. During the Roman Empire, you had roads that could take you everywhere. You had uh, a common a language, common language of, of the Greek, the Koine Greek, that you could go anywhere and speak Greek. And then in addition, they had the miraculous ability to speak in other languages, but basically you could go anywhere and, and speak Greek mm -hmm. and travel on Roman roads. And these Romans who think that they're going to take out the lamb, God's using them. He's using their roads. He's using the language. He's using their, the peace that allows people to roam around freely. Uh, Paul was a Roman citizen that gave him certain rights that other people didn't have. Mm -hmm. And they had no clue that they were executing God's purpose until his words were fulfilled. Yeah. And God's will will always be carried out, no matter what we think. Uh, we cannot fool or foil God. Right. He when will you, be victorious. You follow that story all the way through the Bible. Pharaoh didn't know that he was fulfilling God's plan by, by enslaving the people, and Nebuchadnezzar didn't know he was fill, fulfilling God's plan, and Cyrus might have understood because they showed him. But, you know, it's yeah. that, here's uh -huh. your name. But Yeah. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, the, all along they, these these nations that thought they were the the grand nations of the world didn't know that they were just kind of following God's plan uh, that was laid out already in that uh, that statue that Nebuchadnezzar saw, mm -hmm. and uh, they were just being used by God. Right. They they thought it was the other way around, which brings us to chapter eighteen. Chapter eighteen. This is one writer called this chapter the handwriting on the wall moment for Rome. If we compare it back to uh, to the book of Daniel where um, King King Belshazzar um, saw the handwriting on the wall and you know you've been weighed you've been been uh, measured and been found wanting or found lacking and that very night the kingdom was taken from him this is kind of that moment for Rome where the handwriting is on the wall for them this is this is their uh, their, their come to realization moment that things are not going to work out the way they thought they were um, and this chapter is modeled after the doom announcements of the Old Testament. I like the, uh, we, I don't, do we have doom announcements in our vernacular today? I don't know if we do or not, but if they um, do. They're not quite like those. Maybe, maybe like Ronald Reagan said, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. I'm here to help. Okay. Yeah, but, that's, um, a, that's a doom announcement. So, uh, but it's modeled after, you know, even some of the chapters that we've read in the, the last couple of books that we've studied with Daniel and, and Ezekiel, when it gets into the judgment of other nations, or if you've been reading through the, the look at the book readings, and we're in Isaiah. There's there's doom announced mm -hmm. to other nations in Isaiah, and, and coming in Jeremiah, there's going to be the same thing. So, uh, this chapter is sort of modeled after that style of writing, where there's a there's a kingdom that God has a problem with, and God is going to outline what His problem with that kingdom is and what He's going to do about it. And this is this is Revelation chapter 18. So verses one through three. Start out with, after these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illumined with his glory. And he cried out with mighty voice, saying, Fallen, 
Fallen is Babylon the Great, and she has become a dwelling place of demons and a prison of every unclean spirit and a prison of every unclean something or other. Sorry. That's all right. Bird. Hateful, every un, ev, unclean and hateful bird. There we go. That's a bad bird. That's a bad thing. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the passion of her immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich by the wealth of her sensuality. So, again, we see how often do our, our sections in John start with, and I saw an angel, or I saw this, and, and so here's this angel coming out of heaven, and that Considering everything that we've seen up to this point, we know that when something originates in heaven, that originates with God. So whatever this angel's purpose is, whatever he's doing, whatever message he's bringing, whatever he says, whatever he does, it, it originates from God because he's coming from heaven. Not only that, but he is illumined with glory. And so God is the only creature, the only being that is self-illuminated. Um, if, if we have a light in us, it's because we reflect the light of Christ that is in us. We don't possess that light of our own, but God does possess that light. God is light. And so if he is illumined with glory, then it's because he is reflecting God's glory. Kind of like Moses when he had been talking to God. I think very much like Moses. It's a, it's a signal that this angel has been in the presence of God and, and has received his message from God. Um, he cries out with a mighty voice. And again, the, the idea of a mighty voice, we hear that, we see that over and over and over again. When John sees an angel or a being with some authority speaking, they speak with a loud voice. We've talked about that before. He's not kind of whispering in the corner, you know, hey, if you have time to get around to this, you know, let's think about it. He is booming this forth because it, it originates from God and it, it carries weight. It carries authority with it. And so what is it that he pronounce, pronounces? He pronounces fallen. Fallen is Babylon the great. And so this is that it's repeated. We've seen this phrase um, already before in the book of Revelation, but it's repeated for emphasis. Um, it's, a, it's a double declaration of what is happening to Babylon. Um, Isaiah chapter 21 verse 9 says, Now behold, here comes a troop of riders, horsemen and pairs, and one answered and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon, and all the images of her gods are shattered on the ground. And so this is a prediction of the fall of actual Babylon um, after the, the uh, destruction of Jerusalem. Um, and, and that was a kind of a, a conundrum for the prophets. How can God use a pagan nation like Babylon to come and, and um, discipline his people who were supposed to be his people? So um, I think it was Habakkuk even asked, how, how can one who is more evil than we are be the ones that's going to punish us? But God has his means and his purposes. And so, but God does not leave them unpunished. God is going to pronounce punishment against Babylon. And so it's a repetition of that original declaration that Isaiah makes. Um, and we've seen that before in Revelation 14, verse 8. Another angel, a second one, followed saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who has made all the nations drink of the wine of the passion of her immorality. In Revelation 14, if I remember right, that's the chapter where we just saw this rapid succession of angels coming and making yeah. pronouncements and declarations. And so that was that second declaration that came and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. So just a repetition of something that we've already seen before. Um, the, the great city is abandoned. And so here we've, we've had the city identified. We know that the city is the one that sits on the seven hills. It's the, it's the great city. It's, it's Rome. And so now the great city is abandoned. It becomes a ghost town. Um, that would have been completely inconceivable that, that the city of Rome could ever be decimated to this point, that they could be undone from the position that they were in. Um, but we've seen that kind of pronouncement before, and we'll see some co um, comparisons later on to some of the, the past chapters that we've seen in, in uh, the previous books that we did, but especially in Ezekiel. We saw similar pronouncements about Tyre and um, about some of those kingdoms that were tremendous kingdoms that had built tremendous reputations for themselves that had tremendous power and wealth and, and luxury, and yet God comes in and says it won't be very long until they are utterly destroyed and there won't be anything left but the jackals. And here it is again, this pronouncement against this wealthy city that we can't picture being anything other than as she is, and yet God says she's going to become a ghost town. Um, the nations and the kings and the merchants are here identified as three different kind of subgroups or subsets of people that have profited or benefited from, uh, from the position of, of Rome. Um, the nations, it says they've drunk of the wine of the passion of her immorality. 
And again, we have that juxtaposition thing going on because we've seen in a couple of places over the last few weeks the idea of, of um, Rome drinking of the full wrath of God's, or the full measure of God's wrath. And yet here, those who have benefited from their relationship with Rome have drunk of the passion of her, her immorality. So what is it that partaking of her, her immorality gets you? It gets you a second helping, and that second helping is the, the drinking of the, the wine of God's wrath. Um, the kings here committed, it says they committed acts of immorality with her. They sold their souls. They, they um, laid aside those things that any reasonable, normal human being should have known was right, and they laid all that aside in order to benefit and gain from her wealth. So it didn't matter that Rome was persecuting Christians. It didn't matter that Rome was following after false gods and, and pagan religions. Even though common sense tells us those things are bad, we're going to overlook those things and we're going to do business with her because we like what she has to offer. She, has, she offers us wealth. And then the merchants, again, in the same boat, literally in the same boat, uh, they became rich by the wealth of her sensuality. Um, they were willing to buy what she was peddling. And so in previous chapters, we've seen the idea of the beast or of the dragon or the prophet um, beguiling and fooling the people by the things that she had to say. But in this sense, we're given the idea that she didn't have to work real hard at it. She didn't have to sell her, her, false, um, her, her falsities and her, her lies very hard. Because of what she was offering, because of the wealth and the, the prestige she was offering, they were willing to go down that path. And so it, on the one hand, because she was condemned for fooling everybody, it almost seems like there were innocent bystanders, but that's not the way it's presented here at all. They're not innocent bystanders. They were willing participants in her evil. And so they are culpable for the same punishment that she uh, that, that is being pronounced against her. Revelation 18, verses 4 through 8. And I heard another voice from heaven. You see this time and time again. Heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you may not participate in her sins, and that you may not receive of her plagues. For her sins have piled up as high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Pay her back even as she is paid, and give back to her double according to her deeds in the cup which she has mixed. Mix twice as much for her. To the degree that she glorified herself and lived sensuously, to the same degree give her torment and mourning. For she says in her heart, I sit as a queen, and I am not a widow, and will never see mourning. For this reason, in one day her plagues will come, pestilence and mourning and famine, and she will be burned up with fire, for the Lord God who judges her is strong. So another voice from heaven. Again, we have that same, that same pattern that we see over and over again, just this rapid succession of angels coming forth directly from heaven, directly from God's throne, bringing pronouncements of judgment. Um, and, and this angel calls out, uh, the first angel is calling out in general fallen, it fallen as Babylon. Now this angel addresses God's people. Come out of her, my people. Don't, um, don't get caught up in the destruction because you're kind of trying to live on the periphery of, of um, her sin, her degradation. And so we understand that sometimes as, as people of God, we still live in the world, we still participate in, in some things that the world participates in, but we shouldn't get caught up in doing those worldly things to the point that when it's time to, um, to, to exit from that or to take ourselves away from the world that we're, that we're like Lot's wife and we can't turn away. We, we, get, we get taken into that. Um, and so they're called out for two, two purposes. One, to avoid her sins, to not be taken up in the things she, that she's doing, but also to avoid the destruction and the punishment that she's going to bear because of her sins. When Jesus was talking about the coming destruction of Jerusalem, what did he tell the people? When, when you, you see, see these signs. When you see these things come to pass, get out. Don't wait. Don't turn back and don't look back. Leave. And uh, history records that not very many Christians were caught up in that destruction because they heeded that warning. And so we have a similar warning being given here against, uh, against Rome says her sins were piled up to the heavens, and one commentator likened that to the um, Tower of Babel, um, how they tried to build a, a brick, brick and mortar a building up to heaven and were thwarted by God. Here um, they have erected a, a monument of sin that reaches up to the heavens, and that is their, that's their lasting monument. So Jeremiah 51, verse 9. Before we go there, I want to... Yes. The, 
Um, God wants it. He calls his people to come out and be separate. Yes. He does not want us to mingle uh -huh. to see how close we can come. And that's why we are a peculiar people. Peculiar. We are We're set different apart. from everybody else. We're set apart. Set apart holy. We don't come as close as we can. Right. He wants us to, to be separate and be holy. And when it comes right down to it here, he's actually calling them out of there. Don't don't yeah. even try to be close. Don't even don't even be in close physical proximity, let alone spiritual proximity. Right. Um and so here, Jeremiah 51, 9, we applied healing to Babylon, but she was not healed. Forsake her and let us each go to his own country, for her judgment has reached to heaven and towers up to the very skies. Um, and then uh, Ezra chapter 9, this is after, after they have returned, a, a remnant has returned to the, to the promised land and, and the, uh, the sin of intermarrying with, with foreign uh, wives has been made known to Ezra. That there have been people who have done that and ezra confesses that sin but here in verses five and six he says but at the evening offering i rose from my humiliation even with my garment my robe torn and i fell on my knees and stretched out my hands to the lord my god and said oh my god i'm ashamed and embarrassed to lift up my face to thee oh my god for our iniquities have risen above our heads and our guilt has grown even to the heavens so there's that idea of a monument of sin that's being erected that you know I, jesus said men uh, evil men love the dark because they they think it'll hide their deeds. Our 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 evil deeds are stacked up like a monument if we have not done anything to remove them, and only God can remove them. We can't remove them ourselves, and so um, so we need to understand that if we are not forgiven by the blood of the Lamb, that those sins stand as a monument to our deeds. Um, so. The interesting thing here, her sins are piled up to the heavens, and it says, and God remembered her sins. Um, but how does God treat the sins of his people? Like if you're God's children, what does he do with your sins? Does he remember them? No, he, uh, he wipes them out. Yeah. Eliminates them. So Psalm 103, verse 12 says, as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. So we have the juxtaposition here. We have the sins of, of a pagan empire that stand as a monument to her immorality. But when it comes to the sins of God's people, God wipes those sins away. He, he removes them and, and no longer lets them stand there as a monument, as a tribute to what they've done. And so that choice that's being presented all through the book of Revelation is presented here once again for us. Who do we want to be? Do we want to be God's people that have the sins removed or do we want to be the pagans who God remembers their sins? Uh, Hebrews verses, chapter 8, verses 11 and 12 also add to that. And they shall not teach everyone his fellow citizen and everyone his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. So we have a choice to be part of God's kingdom or to be part of Babylon. Um, shouldn't be a hard choice to make. It's not a hard choice at all. It was, no. At the time, though, it's, it's presented in such a false way that it looks attractive to people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we have to we have to use a little bit of good judgment and wisdom because it's Satan doesn't make things look the way they really right. are. He's always yeah. lying, and so it's it's going to look a whole lot better than it is. Right. And and there again, I'm going to use the word juxtaposition again. Is that okay? That's a good word. Uh, so the way Satan makes sin look, put that in juxtaposition to the way God makes sin look. And a lot of a lot of Revelation is hard to read. It's hard to. It's, it's hard to feel good about reading sometimes because of the imagery, because of the, the stark nature of it, because of the, the, just the, the violence of it. And yet God is being real. He's being very truthful with us about the consequences of sin, whereas Satan, when he presents sin to us, makes it look good. Well, who do you appreciate there? You appreciate it. It depends. Right. Yeah. Um, and so here, the, back to Revelation 18, so the, the pronouncement of judgment here, he says, give back to her double. Um, we've seen this kind of through the book of Revelation a time or two already, where when the punishment is meted out, we're almost taken aback by that, and, but then maybe an angel steps forward and says, this is right, this is good, this is proper judgment that is being, being pronounced because they are that evil, they are that bad, sin is that bad of a thing that when God steps forth in his full wrath, it's not too much, it's not overdoing it. And so he says, give back to her double, and that's, 
that's the indication here that the punishment fits the severity of her crimes. What She's getting what she deserves. There's no other way to say it. And then the torment in the morning, I thought it was an interesting, uh, an interesting comparison where the, the punishment was to be given back double, but the torment in the morning are in accord with or, or to the same level as her self-glorification. And so, um, and, I, and I don't know that there's anything to be made a, a big point there, but I just thought it was interesting that one of them is double, but one of them is, is on level with. And the humiliation is in accordance with her self-glorification. So however much Rome has glorified herself and said, look how great I am, God is going to pile up humiliation to that same level and say, look how awful she is. Um, to, the, to the extent that her crimes have, have elevated her above others and her crimes have, have given her position over others, God is going to double that and say, here's the punishment that is going to bring you down twice as far. It may be hard to double her self glorification because she was sure full of herself. Well, she, yeah, I mean, the emperors believed they were gods. You can't get much more self aggrandized than that. So, verses 9 and 10 says, The kings of the earth who committed acts of immorality and lived sensuously with her will weep and lament over her when they see the smoke of her burning, standing at a distance because of the fear of her torment, saying, Woe, woe, the great city Babylon, the strong city, for in one hour your judgment has come. So those who profited from her immorality now witness her destruction. And there is no honor among thieves. That's an old saying, isn't it? And um, the, it, this is the same kings mentioned in chapter 17 too. We have, a, we have a unified story going here through chapter 17 and 18. And it's um, the things that we saw introduced in 17 are, being, are taking place in 18. Um, they are standing back at a distance watching her burn. Why are they not coming to her rescue? They don't have the power. They don't have the power. They don't have the gumption. They no, don't. That's that's the thing. You know, a lot of a lot of these we see these examples here in Revelation. They're not so concerned about her as they are what they're losing. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. it. That's exactly it. They're mourning not for the loss of their beloved trade partner. We don't love so much Rome so much that we're sad she's going. We love what she brought us so much that we're sad to see her going. We, we loved the wealth that she brought us, the position that she brought us. We loved that, um, the opportunity that she brought us. But frankly, if she's gone and we can find somebody else to bring us that opportunity, we're good. Mm -hmm. you know? And so th there is no loyalty there to Rome itself. The loyalty is there for what they gained from that relationship with Rome. Um, and so th this is, again, a part of the judgment that they deserve. They, because they had sold their souls, so to speak, in order to participate in business with Rome, it's not, we're not supposed to mourn for them or feel sorry for them that their, that their um, mercantile is, is disrupted. Um, now they stand at a distance when earlier they sought intimacy. They, they you know, when Rome was, uh, everything was going great for Rome, everybody wanted to be her best friend. We wanted to talk about, um, you know, me and Rome, we're tight, we're good. Uh, but now that she's being burned, um, we're going to step back from that and say, yeah, maybe I didn't know her very well after all. And so they are now seeking distance instead of intimacy with her. Verses 11 through 20, kind of a longer section, but it just it informs everything up to this point. It, it just elaborates on the, the relationship that these, um, that these um, ancillary um, kingdoms and, and merchants and, and nations and had, everybody had with, uh, with Rome. It says, And the merchants of the earth weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore, cargoes of gold and silver and precious stones and pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and every kind of citron wood and every article of ivory and every article made from every costly wood and bronze and iron and marble and cinnamon and spice and incense and perfume and frankincense and wine and olive oil and fine flour and wheat and cattle and sheep and cargoes of horses and chariots and slaves and human lives. And a partridge. Okay, okay um... And the fruit you long for has gone from you, and all things that were luxurious and splendid have passed away from you, and men will no longer find them. The merchants of these things who became rich from her will stand at a distance because of the fear of her torment, weeping and mourning, saying, Woe, woe, the great city, she who is clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, for in one hour such great wealth has been laid waste. And every shipmaster and every passenger and sailor and as many as make their living by the sea stood at a distance and were crying out as they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like the great city? 
And they threw dust on their heads and were crying out, weeping and mourning, saying, Woe, woe, the great city in which all who had ships at sea became rich by her wealth, for in one hour she has been laid waste. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets, because God has pronounced judgment for you against her. So now the merchants who had become rich are in mourning. And this, again, remember Ezekiel chapter 27. We're not going to read the whole thing, but it's very similar to this when it recounts the destruction of Tyre. And Tyre was that great merchant city who was kind of the hub of all trade within that region. If, if you had an imported item in your home, it came through Tyre. And so for this day and age, if you had were part of the Roman Empire and you had an imported good from some other country, it probably came through Rome because that was the hub of all economic activity. And so all of those, many of those same things, the gold and the silver and the wood and the, the, um, the livestock and all of those things are mentioned in Ezekiel chapter 27 as part of that, um, that list of things that Tyre was known for. So the economic loss would have been devastating for those who had benefited. And they um, would have been wondering, how do we overcome that? How do we, how do we get that economic gain back. Uh, the items here li listed here represent worldwide trade partners. This literally was the center of the known world. And so they are trading with everybody. And, and just like we did with Tyre, when we, we put a map up on the board for Tyre and we talked about where those things came from and we made a big circle all the way around Tyre, that was the known world of the time. We could do the same thing here with Rome and that they were getting all of these traded, uh, traded items from all over the world. Um, Rome's glory was found in her wealth and her material possessions that she garnered from around the world. But when that was lost, when, you know, when, when the trade was no more, what happened to her glory? It's gone. It was gone. And it's, it's almost easy to miss in that list, the last thing on the list, and human lives. Uh -huh. Has all those material things. Right. And then it gets down to slaves and human yep. lives. It just... Like yeah. it was just an afterthought, just all, all in with everything else. Yeah. Um, those who depended on Rome for their wealth would be shocked by her downfall. Again, they can't, they can't fathom the destruction of Rome. And one thing I didn't put in the notes, but, but several times through that reading, if you caught it, it, it specified the amount of time it took for Rome to fall. Mm -hmm. how, how, how long did it take? One hour. It's like one hour. Right now, and she's gone. Yeah, I mean, and does that mean literally that everybody in Rome woke up one morning and an hour later Rome fell? No, but it's that, it's that prophetic yeah. measurement there. Right. One, one hour is just not a whole lot. It's not a short time. When you, when, or it's not a long time. It is a short time. And when you compare how quickly Rome fell compared to how long she existed as a, as a world empire, the end came pretty quick mm -hmm. uh, for Rome. And there was, once that end began, once that progression or that slide towards the end started, there was no stopping it. Um, there was no no stopping that internal decay. So um, there might be a lesson there, maybe for some other nations. Probably so. Um, and then at the end of that section, it, again, it's almost like an afterthought. It's almost like a uh, kind of a, an appendix to the to that long litany of of things that are listed about Rome and and why we've gotten to this point. At the very end, it's like, and now you saints and apostles and prophets rejoice. Um, it's interesting the number of times through the book of Revelation when we see these pronouncements of judgment that there's very often accompanied with that a rejoicing of the righteous. Why is it okay for us to rejoice that all of these people are being doomed? It's because of what they did to God, not because of what they did to us. Right. And Jesus could be righteously indignant because of what people were doing to God, overthrow tables and so forth. He didn't act that way toward injustices toward him. Right. But he really was, he didn't like God being treated that way. So there's a difference in, in us resp responding for a wrong that we suffer and responding for a wrong that God suffers. And when God's will is accomplished, it is cause for God's people to rejoice. Um, and if this is the triumph, and we've, we've talked about that word victory, if this is the victory of good over evil, if this is the victory of God's will over, um, over the beast, over Rome, over the devil, if, if this is God's victory, it's right for us to rejoice. And so God's people are given that command to rejoice because God is winning. Um, the chapter ends here, verses 21 to 24. 
It says, and a strong angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, thus will Babylon, the great city, be thrown down with violence and will not be found any longer. And the sound of the harpists and musicians and flute players and trumpeters will not be heard in you any longer, and no craftsman of any craft will be found in you any longer, and the sound of a mill will not be heard in you any longer, and the light of a lamp will not shine in you any longer, and the voice of the bridegroom and the bride will not be heard in you any longer. For your merchants were the great men of the earth, because all of the nations were deceived by your sorcery. And in her was found the blood of the prophets and of saints and all who have been slain on the earth. So there again, this it's interesting. Um, aren't all angels strong? All angels are strong, but I guess this is a strong this is, angel. This is one who's, um, what John notices about this angel is his strength. And I don't know what angels look like, and I don't know how you tell one from the other, but this one was a strong angel. And any angel, <laughs> any angel can do whatever he wants to do yeah. that he's been commanded by God to do. Yeah. But if you've got a strong angel... That's got to be a sight to behold. So that, that is just an interesting moniker there for him. Um, and he takes a stone like a millstone, uh, like an, a giant millstone, and casts it into the sea. How much would one of those weigh? Maybe 10, 12 pounds? Uh, it depends on the mill. There, there were personal sized ones, and then there were industrial sized yeah, ones. Yeah, this is one of those industrial huge. sized ones. This they is were huge. This is probably one to two tons. Yeah. yeah they were the um, and it is um, one that would have been turned by, not by hand or, or by people, but by beast. This was a big millstone or a big stone like a big millstone. And, and it was picked up by that angel. So there's the strong angel and it was cast into the sea. Think about what a big giant millstone does when it's cast into the sea. It's, it's it, waves everywhere. Does it think about sinking? Oh, it goes straight to the bottom. It doesn't think about sinking. It sinks. Yeah. And is there any recovering it? Not unless you're a strong angel. Not unless you're a strong angel. So this is a... a uh, a symbol of the finality of God's decision here. This is not going to be undone. We're not going to go down and retrieve that millstone and bring it back up and and replace it. God has spoken and it's going to be accomplished. Um, so this is a symbol of Babylon the Great and, and it's it's done. It's spoken of in the, the past tense. Has Rome fallen yet? No, oh, but it's and a yet, done deal. And yet the angel says fallen. So the angel speaks of it. The millstone has been cast into the sea. All of this is being presented in the past tense, even though it hasn't happened yet in John's day. And so, but because God has ordained that it will happen, we can talk of it as having happened. Um, six times the, uh, the angel uses the term not any longer. And so as you look at all those things, no music will be heard any longer, no celebrations, no crafts, no, um, no weddings. Um, none of these things will take place any longer. And that is, again, an, an indication of the complete nature of, of the, uh, the pronouncement of judgment against Babylon. Um, three reasons here are given for Rome's destruction. First, uh, it says the merchants were the great men of the earth. Um, these were, uh, this here was an indication um, there in that last verse. It says, uh, oops, last verse. Um, it says the uh, getting old, Gary. My eyes don't work as well. Oh, man. For your merchants were the great men of the earth, because all of the nations were deceived by your sorcery, and in her was found the blood of the prophets. So the merchants were the great men of the earth. Um, the, the earth was laid at Rome's feet. She had every opportunity to be a blessing to the world that could have been given her to be to be a blessing to the world. And yet she used what she had been given to elevate herself and to, and to hold people down, to hurt people. Uh, the nations were deceived by her sorcery. She led other nations into her deception. She, she led them into her false religions. That she led them into her um, immoral business practices, all of those things. Other nations were deceived by her sorceries. And that final straw, that final um, pronouncement of judgment is because the blood of the prophets and saints um, you know, flowed through her streets. Uh, she was responsible for the death of the righteous and that God could not allow to stand. So how many times have we seen that idea through the book of Revelation where God, where the saints are asking, how long, the Lord, will you let this stand against us? Or then there's a moment of silence in heaven where their prayers are elevated to the throne. Or there's some symbol that's given to us to show us that it is Rome's treatment of God's people that really is a driving force behind his pronouncement of judgment against them. 
Exactly. We see it again. Yeah. We do have questions. We have no time. You know, I figured out a way to make our classes shorter. How? Uh, if we just print it in a smaller font. Oh yeah. We could then they would part. be. Then they would be shorter. This is. And maybe we could get through. This is twelve. This is twelve. I think I'll go to ten. If we go to ten, that is that would save us. That would save I, us about one eighth. We could we could use half as many slides as cramp. Oh, smaller, there we go. That'd be a good fonts. idea. Smaller, smaller fonts, fonts on the slides. On the slides. And I think that, that's a that's a good idea. See there, that is awesome. That is awesome. Thank you very much.